All right, uh, let's get started. Um, uh, homework 2 has been posted and as usual it's due next Friday um, at 11 a.m. I do have solutions to homework 1 with me as I mentioned some time before uh, I'll only be handing out hard copies but I do it at the end of the lecture sometimes I forget so if I do please remind me. Uh, again a reminder um, your mini project groups are due a week from this coming Monday. So if you have not done so already, please email me uh, the names of your three uh, group members. Um, any questions on logistics? All right, let's... So we're looking at asymptotic notation last time. So just as a, uh, someone has my shirt. Hmm. All right. Um, we say a function g of n is big O of f of n. If you plot g of n and there exists a number n naught so that beyond that some constants times f of n is always above this curve g. So if this is the case, if there exists such constant c and n naught, then we say uh, g of n is big O of f of n. Uh, we say g of n is omega of f of n. If there exists some other constant n1 and some other constant epsilon, so that epsilon times f always lies below. Okay? And we say g of n is theta of f of n if it's both big O and omega. So uh, we quickly went over some properties uh, I'm not going to prove them. I think some of them are actually proved in the book. If not, good exercise to kind of do them from first principles. But these are the properties that we're going to use quite a bit while proving, uh, while doing runtime analysis of algorithms. So the first property is transitive, which says if f is, if g is big O of, g is big O of f and f is big O of h, then g is big O of h. Additive, if both g and f are big O of h, then if you add them up, then it's big O of H. Um, the one thing that you have to be careful about this additive thing is it only holds when you're adding up constant many such guys. Right, so if, if you have, say, G1 is big O of H, G2 is big O of H, Gn up to all of them are big O of H, then you cannot say adding them all up will still be big O of H, okay? So only if you're adding constant many such functions is this true. A multiplicative, if g is big O of h1 and f is big O of h2, then the product is big O of the upper bounds. All right, um, so a bunch of reading assignments, if you have not already done so, I highly recommend uh, that you go through them. Uh, there is another reading assignment for today. Uh, we're going to, as I mentioned, talk about analyzing the worst case runtime of an algorithm. And you guys have seen doing the big O analysis and you probably are familiar and you can probably do it fairly easily. Uh, we'll also be doing some big omega analysis and that causes confusion. So please do go ahead, uh, I'll quickly go over it in class today, but please do go ahead and read up, uh, read up this thing um, in more detail. Are there any questions? All right, so uh, we're going to do a bit more about asymptotic uh, runtime analysis. In particular, we're going to do analyze a very simple algorithm to do a simple search problem where given n numbers a0 to n minus one and some other number v and you want to figure out whether v is one of those ais or not. And then we're going to start analyzing the runtime of the gate shapely algorithm, which I don't think we'll have time to finish today, but we will do so uh, on Monday. Okay. Uh, any questions while I switch over to the document camera? Which works today? Um, I forgot your name, sorry. Nixon. Nixon. Uh, what is the solution? Uh, as I just said, I have them over here. I'm going to hand them out of the class. And they will not be posted online anywhere. Any other questions? 
All right. Um, before I start talking about runtime analysis, I'd like to make one point which tends to get lost because typically we will just use asymptotic analysis to do runtime analysis. But there's an important distinction. Asymptotic analysis holds for any function. It just so happens that we'll use it for the function which is the runtime of an algorithm. But you can talk about asymptotics of any function that you want, okay? So just to, uh, so I say as an aside, uh, while usually we will use asymptotic analysis to talk about, oh, I can't spell today. Okay, a uh, runtime of an algorithm. If you know when we defined big O and big omega, we were not talking about any algorithm, we were not talking about runtime of the algorithm. We just said there are functions of G and F. Okay. So the definitions uh, are independent of the semantics of G. So again, Asymptotics by definition are only defined over functions which are, you know, just map, say, national numbers to national numbers or real numbers to real numbers. It is indeed going to be true that pretty much whenever we use it in this course, this function g of n will denote the runtime of the algorithm. So we are we're going to assign semantics to that function g or f or t, uh, but in general need not be true. So for example, um, I mean, I can, might as well just use g of n to denote the number of times my son Akash says no to me on his end day of existence. To me in his, let's say, nth month. If you're curious, it's an exponentially growing function, but the point is it's not runtime of any algorithm. It's in some function. Okay, that, that's something that you should always keep at the back of your mind. Again, most of the time we're going to use it for runtime analysis, but not always. So there are going to be cases where you'll have to talk about asymptotics of things that are not runtimes of. All right, okay. So if I have an algorithm A, and we're talking about input size n for the algorithm, then we define TA of n to be the maximum number of steps A takes on any input of size n, okay? And then later on we'll talk about, you know, talk about say, you know, things like TA of N is big O of G of N, or it is say omega of F of N. So again, just to be sure, it's the reverse case runtime analysis. So you're given the input N, and T of N is the maximum possible runtime over all valid inputs of size N. Okay, so in particular, if, it, if A were the gauge shapely algorithm, and in this case, capital N would be what? When you have N men and N women, what's the size of the input? 2N squared, I said, remember this. Well, it's best if you understand why that's the case. In the worst case, at least make sure you remember this. Uh, so we're going to talk about the runtime in terms of 2N squared. And then what we want to argue is, if we talk about the runtime of inputs of size 2n squared, we want to say what is the maximum number of steps or all possible uh, preference lists for n men and women. Because again, it's always the worst case runtime. All right, let's see if... Uh, 
pi. Uh, I don't know how annoying this is. If it gets too annoying, let me know and I can try to see what we can do. So, let's go through an example. So we're going to look at, I said, the search problem. So in this case, the input are n plus one numbers, say a zero up to a n minus one and v. And the output, you want to output i such that a i is equal to v if one such i exists, and let's say minus one otherwise. So you're just searching whether the number v is in one of these first n numbers. So what would be an obvious algorithm to solve this? All right, so as Evan said, you do linear search. That is, you just go through each AI, check whether it's equal. If it's equal, just output that I. Otherwise, once the loop is done, output minus one. So uh, I'll just call that algorithm search, even though linear search is probably more valid. Uh, so it's taking n numbers a0 to n minus 1 and another value v. Oh, by the way, in this case, what is the size of the input capital N in terms of little n? Sorry? It's not quite n, it's close. It's not exactly n. N plus one, so you have lit N numbers A0 to N minus one, but then you have that extra number V. So in this case, it's N plus one. So it turns out asymptotically, then any bound in terms of capital N, little N won't make any difference, right? Because they're basically the same. Uh, but again, just to be sure, capital N in this case, little N plus one. All right, so you're going to do, so you run the loop from I, from zero to N minus one, if AI matches this value V, then you return I. Otherwise, if you don't find anything, you return minus one. Okay, so again, just kind of walk through it. So what I'm going to do is kind of do the runtime. I am, I'm pretty sure if I ask you guys, you should be able to do this, uh, this something fairly simple. But what I want to do is, and I'm assuming you have seen this before already, so we'll do the analysis, but then we'll carefully unpack where we use the various properties of asymptotic analysis, just to make sure you guys see where those properties are used. Okay. All right, so to do this, uh, we're going to add some more things. So we're going to say if T0 is number of time this loop runs, we're going to denote T1 to denote the runtime of this uh, body of the loop, okay? So runtime of body of loop, and T2 is just the time that I, if I go end up returning minus one, that's uh, for this step. So maybe talk to your friends for half a minute. Uh, let me and try to figure out like big O notations for what each of these values should be. So I want you to give me TO is big O of something and give me this best possible bound that you can think of for T1 and T2.
Any questions before we go on? Evan. So, if you consider A0, A and minus 1 as distant, what do you consider as a set? Um, so, Evan's question was would I consider A0 to A and minus 1 distinct inputs or as one set? Uh, the answer is from the perspective of runtime analysis, doesn't matter. Both have n elements, and so that's all I care about. Um, it would matter in certain cases if you wanted to do some fancy search over these things or things like that, but in this case, it really doesn't matter. Any other questions? All right, so if not, what would be a valid upper bound on T0? Sorry? Big O of n, in particular, you can even say it's at most n, right? Because the loop is going to run at most n times. And so this is definitely big O of n, good. T1, big O of one, which is running an if statement, a comparison, and a return, right? So maybe when you boil down to like processor level uh, instructions, there could be more than two or three, but it's always constant, right? So this is constant. And by similar argument, since you're just returning one value, it's constant. Now, let's look at the runtime analysis of this guy. Okay, so to be more precise, I should say runtime of search. I have a loop that runs for, oh. I have a loop that runs for T0 times. Each iteration, each T0 iteration takes T1 time. So the total time I'll spend uh, on both of these together is T0 times T1. And then I'm going to spend time T2 on the last guy. Right, so again, you have a loop, row plus certain run time, each iteration is only taking so much time, so you take the product. So T of n is at most T0 times T1 plus T2. We just argued that T0 is at most n, Right, so this is at most n times order one because we have argued that each loop runs in constant time. And the last step is also a constant time. Okay, so this just follows from the observ observations that we made. Now let's just use uh, the properties of uh, asymptotic notation to kind of make progress. So here we're first going to use the multiplicative stuff, so we're multiplying two guys, so you can bring everything inside the big O, so this is big O of n. And then we make the trivial observation that, you know, one is at most n, so big O of one is at most big O of n, so this is big O of n. And then we apply the additive thing, right? If you have two functions which are both big O of h, if you sum them up, you get big O of h. Right? And so here you apply additive, and so this is big O of n. Okay. And so we argued, uh, so I can even write it as a claim, that the search runtime is big O of n. So I can talk to your friends for half a minute, let me know if any, oh. Um, sorry, I'm blanking on your name. Uh, Tyler. Uh, why did you say that the second one is now than? Uh, because that's always true. Big O of one is always big O of n, right? Because one is less than equal to n. Okay. okay. So I, what I'm writing there is kind of a trivial statement, but what that allows me to do is apply the additive thing in the next thing. Um, forgot your name, sorry. Dave. Dave. Um, can you still apply the additive thing if it's just O of 1? Also, so, uh, Dave's question is, could I have directly applied uh, additive thing on bigger one? Yes, if you combine the two facts. Okay. Yeah. Evan. How would you, how would you 
how would you prove that your algorithm is correct? Uh, so Evans' question is, how do you prove that this algorithm is correct? Great question. Uh, prove it by induction or contradiction, either would work. Uh, if you have never proved that this algorithm is correct because it was so obvious to you guys, uh, it's always a great exercise trying to prove things that are obvious because sometimes obvious things are wrong. Uh, in this case, it is obvious and it is correct. But again, if you're not that comfortable with proofs, try to prove that this is correct either by contradiction or by induction and both would work. Any other questions? Is everyone okay? Can I move on to the big omega analysis? If there are questions, I'm happy to take them. There's... Oh, I forgot if I'd ever mentioned this. Uh, if you think you have a question and you're kind of uh, hesitant to ask it because you think you might slow down the class, um, so I'll say two things. First, I thank you for your consideration. And the second, it's not your job to decide whether you're slowing down the class or not. Okay, it's mine. So if I really think you are really slowing down the class, I'll, I'll handle it appropriately. Uh, which is to say, I'm not going to shoot you down. I'm going to tell you nicely that we can do it afterwards. But if you have questions, please do ask. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'd rather kind of go a bit slow to make sure everyone's on the same page and just speed up through things. Having said that, questions? Okay, so let's now do uh, uh, a big omega analysis. And so this is where, uh, as I said, I mean, you guys have done big omega analysis before, uh, definitely in data structures. Have any of you done big omega analysis on runtimes of algorithms before? Okay, I see one hand. Okay. That's fine. Uh, we're going to do it today for this search algorithm. Um, and as I said, there is a, a support page that talks more about this. All right, so before, so what we want to do is, so I, I'm going to argue that uh, you can actually even say that this runtime is omega of n. And note that this implies it is actually theta of n because it's both, both big O and omega. All right. So you want to prove that the worst case runtime of an algorithm, in this case a search algorithm, is omega n. Right. Um, so let's try to unpack and see what we exactly have to prove. We have to argue, if we were just going by definition, T of n is the worst case runtime over all inputs of size n, right? So what we want to argue is for basically every large enough n, the worst case input of size n takes omega n steps. Right, so for every n, there exists a worst case input for which is true. Okay. So again, so I said, let's unpack the definition. Um, so recall, so I'm just going to write, oh, by the way, I'm just dropping the subscript search because it's clear from the context what algorithm I'm talking about, so we're just going to do that. So uh, T of n is max number of steps. <coughs> taken by any input or any input of size n, okay? So if you are thinking of this way, if you're thinking, well, let's try to list all the inputs of size n in some order, right? Then this is max of uh, number of steps taken on, say, the first input of size n, max, uh, I can, thank you. Uh, on second input of size n, on third input of size n, and so on and so forth. Right? So if I look at all possible inputs of size n and list them somehow, and then figure out what is the runtime of the algorithm, a number of steps taken by the algorithm on each of them, 
and I'm going to get a big set of numbers and the max value in that set is what I'm looking for. Does that make sense? So again, I have the runtime of the algorithm on all inputs of size n and I'm looking for the worst case runtime. Now, just by the fact that I'm talking about, I, I took like half a minute to tell you what this number is, following the definition as is, is not a good way to do an omega analysis, right? Because why? Well, so here's one way you can do it, which is a, if you are able to pull it off, is indeed correct, is say, somehow argue, say the thousandth input of size n is the worst case input, analyze what happens for that algorithm on that specific input, and then you're done. Right? The issue is that first step, how do you argue that say the thousand guy is indeed the worst? Was it not 9900? Right? <laughs> and so it's very hard and virtually impossible not to say just a lot of work for nothing, trying to prove that the specific input is a worst case input. Okay? So again, what we're trying to do more generally here is we are trying to find the maximum of a set of numbers, okay? And what we, again, remember, what we really want is to prove a lower bound on this max, not figure out this max exactly. Even though figuring out exactly would give us what we want, but it's more work. So as another example, so I think I'd given this example earlier. Let's say we want to argue that the maximum age in this room is lower bounded by certain number, right? One way to go ahead is go to everyone, ask what is your age, then figure out what is the maximum. Or you can say, I volunteer my age is 39 or will be in a few days. And so hence the lower bound on the maximum age in this room is at least 39. That, and that's a perfectly valid argument to make. So we're going to apply the same trick here. Instead of trying to figure out the worst case input, for each n, all we will show is there exists some input on where the algorithm runs in omega n steps and we'll be done. Okay. All right, so. So the proof idea, or in this case, the proof strategy for proving omega lower bounds for T of n is to just exhibit one input of size n that on which algorithm takes at least L steps. And the reason why I said this is strategy is because this strategy works for any algorithm, even though we are trying to prove this for search. Uh, we're going to prove that uh, L is essentially omega of n. Okay. So even if we are able to show there exists one input on which the algorithm takes omega n steps, that immediately implies, okay. So for the search problem, what we have to do is figure out one input on which the algorithm takes omega n steps. So, and of course you guys can't even see that. So talk to your friends, let me know any questions. If not, try to think of an input for each n in which the algorithm will take omega n steps.
Uh, any questions? Okay, if not, any suggestions for an input of size n that will force the search algorithm to take omega n steps? Uh, I have to ask your name. Alex. Alex. Uh, so I ask the question is, wouldn't that be for any input? Good point. Uh, good question. The answer is no, because what if A0 itself is V? Right? Then the algorithm in the very first iteration of the loop will say, aha, I found V, done. And so I'm done in constant time. Right? So it will indeed prove that the algorithm runs in omega one time, which is a perfectly valid and correct asymptotic analysis for it, but it's not as strong as we want. So we want omega n. We want another example that forces the algorithm to do more. Uh, Mehmet. Right, so Mehmet saying is, uh, and that's valid, what, uh, think of the case where v is the very last guy, is a n minus one, right? Then it's true. Or even it's not there at all, right? So v is just not present in the set, uh, and maybe Alex, that's what you were thinking about. Uh, you just kind of force the algorithm to go through it. Okay. All right. So let me write down both because uh, it illustrates important points that you have to keep in mind while doing big omega analysis. Uh, so let's do the correct one first. So proof details. So consider, so fix any n, and consider the case, say, ai is equal to i, and v is equal to n, okay? And I said uh, many others possible. For example, uh, a of n minus one itself could be v, and ai is not equal to v for all i, uh, st strictly less than n minus one. Right. So this guy, so remember I goes from, um, so this is a case where V is not present in the set, or it could be present at the last. It's also fine if it's present at say the n over two th position, right? So then the algorithm takes n over two iterations, and so it takes at least n over two steps, that's still omega of n. All right, so what does this mean? Uh, so in this case, if you look at the runtime of the algorithm, um, let's see, where is this guy? So what I, since I want a lower bound, I'm just going to ignore the time taken to return this guy, just concentrate on how much time the loop takes. So T of n, uh, or in this case, T of n is at least number of iterations of the loop times number of time each guy works. Uh, this is at least n times one because since my V is not present in any of the AIs, the algorithm will run all n iterations of the loop and it will do a bunch of stuff there. It's going to check its you know, condition and if and all that, but it doesn't matter what it does, it has to do at least one step. It has to do something. Right? So it will have n iterations of the loop. Each iteration will have at least one step happening. Right? And so this is n, and we are done. This is omega n. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, I kind of switched between little n and omega n, but as I said, they're just with an additive one of each other, so asymptotically they don't make any difference. Okay. Um, The other example that we talked about is sometimes known as best case analysis. And so in this case, if A0 was equal to V, then T of N, uh, we'll argue is at least omega of one. And again, it's not an incorrect statement. It's just that it's not as strong as saying it takes omega N steps, okay? And so, in general, you might ask the question, well, this is a search algorithm, it was kind of fairly obvious or not that hard to see how to come up with. How do you figure out such bad examples for algorithms in general? 
And the answer is it's really hard for an arbitrary algorithm to do this, right? But typically when you do and uh, the upper bound analysis that sometimes gives you clues towards what are the inputs that are going to make that analysis tight and that's what you use to prove this part. Okay. Um, any questions? On the definition of T of n, uh, doing big O analysis or big omega analysis of algorithms. It's too close to the weekend. But I'm still not letting you guys go. So, uh, all right, so. So we talked about uh, doing asymptotic runtime analysis and we did it for a simple algorithm. Uh, so now what we want to do is analyze the Gale Shapley algorithm, right? because that, that's what we, that's the, so remember we looked at the stable matching problem, uh, looked at the brute force algorithm, looked at the Gale Shapley algorithm, proved that it's correct, uh, but we never analyzed its runtime. Okay, and so that, that's what our next goal is. And again, please remember this pseudocode, if you're not, again, everyone's free at the beginning. Uh, and then there is a loop that happens till there is a free woman who has can propose to someone, there's some engagements happening and so on and so forth. And at the end you just output uh, the engage pairs as final number. Okay. Um, note that we have done one part of runtime analysis. We have actually already argued uh, that this loop runs for at most n square times. Okay, so we, are, we have made some progress, we have not done it completely. Okay. Um, one question you might ask is, well, we have proved an upper bound, but is it true that it will have to take n squared steps on some input? Uh, great question, solve question two on homework two, and that's where you get the answer. So the answer is yes, there does exist. In particular, for every, n, uh, for every value of n, there exists an input instance with two n preferenceless, so that the Gale Shapley algorithm actually runs omega n squared iterations of its loop. Okay. But before we, you know, dive in and start analyzing the algorithm step by step, there are many things that we have not decided or determined, right? So for example, we have not even decided how the input is represented. But we said they're preferenceless, they are n elements, right? How do we represent it? Is it in an array? Is it in a list? And these things matter, right? So to figure that out. We said find a free woman, right? So if there are n free women, how do we find one quickly? We said W should pick her best unproposed man. How do you do that quickly? We have to figure out if W proposes to M, who M is engaged to, how do you figure that out, that one out quickly? And then M finally has to decide if he's engaged to W prime, whether he prefers W prime to W. So how do you do that quickly, okay? And in particular, we would like to do all four of these steps in constant time. And the quick reason is, I have this loop, the body of the, all of these four questions are related to what you do in the body of the loop. Right. I have n squared iterations. If I argue that each iteration takes constant time or big O of one time, I'll prove everything is big O of n squared. Okay. And that's going to be our final goal. So it turns out, and for many of these questions, now you really have to pick your data structures because without that, you can't really answer these questions. Okay. It turns out that the data structures that we need for implementing gauge shape the algorithm are really simple. You just need arrays and linked lists. You might need a 2D array or a you know, linked list of arrays, but you know, there's just simple combination of those. And so let's quickly review the basic properties uh, that we're going to use. So think that you have n numbers a1 to an, and you want to store them in an array or a list. So an array, as you know, is just kind of an ordered thing. The ith guy has ai. Uh, note that I'm bucking CS tradition and starting from one. Uh, that might annoy some of you, but mathematically it doesn't make any difference. So I'll typically start off with one just because it makes my life notation easier sometimes. 
Uh, linked list is you have each of these elements uh, in a block and we'll assume it's a doubly linked list. So you can go back and forth. And not only that, you have pointers to the front and the last element of the list. Yeah. All right, so let's do some quick, uh, uh, quick Q and A. So I want to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to list various operations that you would want to do on list and array. And what I want from you guys are how much, what is the asymptotic time you need to do these for both arrays and linked list. So if I want to access the ith element, uh, let's say in an array, how much time would it take? Constant, big of one, you just go look up the ith element. Okay. Uh, linked list. Well, if you want to be a bit careful, I can say it's big of i because you have to make i steps. But again, in worst case, i is never more than n, so it's big of n. If I want to check whether a number e is present in in the array, how much time would it take? Big of n. If it were sorted, if it were sorted, you can then log in because then you can do binary search. Uh, how much time in a linked list? So in the worst case, it's big O of n, right? because you have to just kind of walk through the entire list. Okay. If you have to insert an element in an array, how much time would it take? In the worst case, it could be O of n, because you might want to insert something at the top, and then it will shift everything down. Right? So this is big off n. A link list. All right, so here's a bit tricky. It's constant if I tell you where to insert it. So if you have a pointer to where you want to insert it, right? So assuming I, I know the pointer to the block after which or before which I want to insert the element, then this is constant. What about deleting an element? It's the same. If you delete the top guy, you have to push everything up. So that's a big off n. And again, if you're given a pointer to the linked list, it's big O of one, and this is where having doubly linked list is useful. All right. Um, and then the question is, what kind of data is the array good for versus linked list? And array is good for static, where your elements are not going to change. Because what does that mean? I really don't need to do insert or delete at any point of time, right? because it's fixed, and then I can access things quickly. Whereas linked list is typically uh, better for dynamic where to insert and delete because these are constant time operations. But we lose on, uh, on, on the, uh, you know, accessing a particular element. Um, so we're going to start off today is talking about an O and N squared times implementation uh, of the gate shape algorithm. And among other things, uh, we're going to do more analysis with runtime. When I made this slide first, I never thought Usain Bolt would be retired and I'm still teaching this course, but that is still, that is the case. And so I said, we already have made progress on what the gale shape uh, for runtime analysis the gale shape algorithm, because we've argued that there are at most n squared iteration, okay? Let's look at what happens what else. I'm initializing two n men and women to be free, right? So it's just, order n time. I'm returning at most n pairs, so this is order n time, right? So I have an initialization step and a return step, both of which take order n time. I have a big loop where basically all of the work is happening. There are n squared iterations. So if I want an overall n squared time implementation, what I want to do is to show that each loop can be run in constant time. So let's go over this again just to make sure uh, this is clear. Um, so again, we want to implement the gale shapely algorithm. And if you look at kind of the structure of the algorithm, you have an initialization step. So this is where you're saying all men and women are free. And then you have a loop where you're checking if there exists a free woman who can propose. And then you have body of a loop. 
and then finally you just sorry uh, you want to output this address okay and so again if you look at the structure it's actually kind of similar to what we did for linear search too um, except we have this extra initialization step let's say it takes time uh, t0 uh, let t1 be number of iterations which have already argued that it's n squared. Uh, let the body of the loop be t2, outputting be t3. And so what we have overall is t of n is at most uh, t0, which is the initialization step, plus t1, which is the number of iterations times t2, which is the worst case time that it take on each iteration and then t3 at the end, okay? And so the point is, if we argue, let's say t0 and t3 are at most order n, and again, this should be fairly intuitive because you're just initializing two n values and returning two n values, so these should be O of n. Uh, kind of the thing that's going to take us a bit more time to prove So it's not immediately obvious that you can implement each iteration in constant time. Yeah, Evan. Right, so Evan's question is since they are big of n, are they also big of n squared? And yes. And so that's what I'm going to use next. So if these are true, then this is big O of n plus n squared times order one plus order n. I can add up these two order n guys. This is order n plus order n squared, and here I'm using the multiplication thing. I'll then use the fact that big O of n is at most big O of n squared, and then this, and then use the additive thing again, so it's big O of n So it seems like uh, as long as we can argue that each iteration of the loop can be done in big O of one time, then that's fine. And if you think about it, we don't have time to think about through all. It's not too hard to show that you can do it in big O of n time. Okay, so implementing each iteration in big O of n time is not that hard. Is that if you want to argue that it's actually constant time that it needs more work, and we have to be a bit careful. So that's what we're going to do on Monday, and I'm going to put the solutions, half of them on this side and half on this side.